people all together bring you honor give you reverence standing as one in your presence this is your church God built it this is your church God All right, good morning, morning. Uh, can you greet the person beside you for a while? Just give them a good morning. Come on. Okay, we are uh, starting a brand new series today. All right. So uh, it's a series that talks about, you know, uh, the church. Okay, we call it We Your People. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, it's called uh, We Your People. So, um, uh, we will be looking into the role of uh, the church, okay, being a salt and light. We will look into some aspect of the church that's uh, uh, quite integral with our mission, okay, uh, as a movement. So um, before I go to the word, okay, uh, let me say a few things for a while. Uh, we currently uh, have 15 uh, people in our Victory Weekend. Okay, um, their Victory Weekend actually ends today, so we're going to have water baptism later. Okay, so we praise God for that. So we have, uh, we started with our uh, Victory Weekend yesterday. So just for everyone's information, um, each and every year, each and every year, we have three uh, Victory Weekend schedules. Okay, so uh, we've scheduled three Victory Weekends for the year. So um, if you haven't been through the Victory Weekend yet, or you are, you know, um, you know, uh, following up on someone, discipling someone whom you think should be in the Victory Weekend, Okay, uh, please do connect them to us. Okay, uh, talk to our discipleship pastor. Okay, so uh, which is uh, Pastor Tom right here. Okay, uh, was just ordained two weeks ago. Was it two weeks ago? Okay, two weeks ago. So um, together uh, with Pastor Tom is our discipleship admin, uh, Miss Herlene Sabiliano. Okay, uh, who's uh, you know um, helping out in our discipleship ministry. Okay, so. Um, we will be reading from Matthew chapter 16 here today. So uh, first and foremost, uh, we, I do want to apologize for, you know, some of the wrong stuff that we have on the screen last Sunday. So uh, may, perhaps you, you, you may have or not, you did notice that, but nonetheless, uh, we want to apologize for that, for, you know, the, the wrong grammars on the screen okay, last, last week. So that was, that was on me. All right. So another thing. Um, while I was preaching last Sunday, I, I have to say this uh, with a smile, okay? So, while I was preaching last Sunday, I saw that there was like uh, one or two of you were sleeping. So, it wasn't really an insult to me. But, let me just remind everyone, uh, we come here to worship, all right? So, no matter how cold it could be uh, at 9 in the morning, no matter how tired you were, tired you were rather, last, uh, last night, uh, we come here ready to worship, Amen. Okay, uh, we don't come to church to sleep, okay? W what do you think about that? Does, that? does that make sense? We don't come here to sleep, right? So um, there is a huge implication to that in your Christian walk. So if you choose to sleep on worship, on corporate worship, uh, might as well, uh, you know, not join corporate worship then. All right, so stand on your feet for a while. Let's look into Matthew chapter 16. Okay, this is Matthew chapter 16. We will be reading from verses 13 down to verse 19. Okay, so we are reading from the ESV. I'll wait for everyone to be there. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 down to verse 19. All right, so, so I think it's, it would be easy for you to spot your, uh, the book of Matthew. This is your first uh, book. Uh, in the new in the New Testament, so you can just go there. Some of you are using your digital Bibles; it's totally fine. Matthew chapter sixteen, verses thirteen down to verse sixteen. All right, so let me just read this for everyone. It says here: Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, "Who do people say that the Son of Man is?" 
And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Let's pray for him. Lord, we come before you here today. Can we just lift our hands before God in this space for all? Just lift your hands before God. Lord, we come before you. Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that you are the cornerstone. Lord, everything that the church does, Lord, emanates, God, from our understanding of who you are. And so, Lord, as we look into your word here today, we worship you. We bless your name. We ask that you would endow us, Lord, with wisdom as you try, Lord, to understand, Lord, such a familiar verse for us. And perhaps for us, God, for some of us, this might be a time of unlearning that we may hear what you have to say, God, to every single one of us here today. Lord, today, as we lift our hands before you, we bless you. We honor your name. We praise you, Lord. Amen and amen. You can be seated now. Um, okay, uh, here's how we're going to uh, look into this. Uh, you know, we have Matthew chapter 16 uh, right in front of us. So we have, uh, you know, verses 13 down to verse 19. So let me just ask for a while, who among you here uh, this morning... Okay, is quite familiar with the verses or the passage that we have here today. You're quite familiar with this. You've read this at one point uh, in your Christian walk, all right, great. Okay, um, I am very much familiar with this. In fact, you know, I have preached okay, uh, wrongly on this, okay, on several occasions. So, yeah, so uh, it's my time to redeem that, all right? So, <laughs> okay, so we have, you know, a few verses here today. So while I was looking at this yesterday... Um, you know, I realize, okay, um, there's perhaps a good way or a manner at which we could sort this out. So, um, you know, we've endeavored to divide this entire passage that we have into these four, uh, you know, sections, okay? Um, as we understand, it is a progression. It begins with two questions, okay? You folks saw that. Okay, there was a question coming from Jesus himself, Right? So we have two questions found in verses 13. That's the first one. And you have the next question found in verse 15. And then, okay, an answer to that question, okay, was a confession. All right? So you could actually say question and then answer, but, you know, just for it to rhyme, we'll say confession. Okay? But rather, it's, it really is a confession. So we have a confession that's found in verse 16. And then, Jesus talked about a certain revelation out of that confession, okay, in verse 17. And then what I love about this is, you know, in, in these in this few verses, Jesus, you know, was intentional in telling them what the purposes of the revelation, uh, the purposes of the revelation are. Okay, so he wanted them to understand, all right, there is a reason to this revelation. There is a reason why I asked this question. And of course... Okay, the reason for that is the last one, which is the mission that he has given Peter, the disciples, and of course, the church today. Okay, so let me just look at the first one. Okay, it begins with the first one. So I'd like for you to just open flat your Bible in front of you or your digital Bibles. We're going to look into this. Verse 13 says, Now when Jesus came into the, into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Or rather, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He then said to them, but who do you say that I am? All right, so, um, you know, um, everything that, as we understand, everything that Jesus 
you know, uh, uh, would do, as we understand, is always intentional. There's no such thing as a, you know, a, a random thing in the things that uh, he has been doing. And this is, not, is, this is no different to that. You know, Caesarea Philippi, okay, there are two Caesareas, if I'm not mistaken, okay, um, this is Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. Um, this specific, you know, uh, place right here, okay, was a place where uh, there was a, uh, perhaps a, uh, a lot of uh, pagan worship. Okay, so meaning to say, so meaning to say, um, if you go to Caesarea Philippi then, during that time, okay, which was, which was you know, slightly elevated, you know, there was a dominance of Baal worship in this place. Okay, so um, if you were here uh, during our prayer and fasting, I did mention about this, okay, I'm um, quoting, quoting a psalm, that, you know, there is, uh, you know, there is a, a battle for, perhaps the battle for the high places, okay, for, you know, for some reasons, okay, for some reason, you know, people would, you know, pagans would worship on the mountains, you know, uh, pagans would try to put shrines, okay, on top of the hills or on the hillsides. Uh, people think that, you know, if we get to people worship in the mountains, okay, that's the, perhaps the highest level of worship that they could give uh, these certain deities. So when Jesus was there with his disciples, okay, perhaps surrounded by this pagan worship, he starts asking this question. He was like saying, okay, Peter, John, and the rest of you, in light of the pluralistic world that we have right now, who the people say I am? Okay? In fact, he asked this question specifically, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Um, you know, last week, okay, um, you know, last week I visited a, uh, you know, I visited a mosque here uh, in our in our city. Uh, I have a photo right there, and I just had a conversation with the, uh, I had a conversation with the ustad, uh, and the imam. Okay, um, so these are the teachers, the teacher of Arabic, and of course, uh, you know, uh, the, the imam, the one who regulates worship in their place. And you know, I had a good, perhaps, 40-minute conversation, okay, with them. And, you know, just to make friends, of course, and, of course, to fulfill some of my assignments, okay, in the seminary. Actually, that's the first reason. So, you know, I started building friendship with this person, okay, with the imam. And we started talking about, you know, of course, you know, you, you talk about, you, you talk to a religious leader, you always end up talking about God, right? You don't talk about just the, the you know, the, the facade of the building or the, the Quran, you start talking about God. And yeah, c can we put that down now? All right, so, and, and, and here, here's the thing. You know, I remember while talking with him, I remember what Josh McDowell said. That you know, in our generation right now, we could actually be talking about God and people would, would agree with us, right? Have you ever heard people say, um, your God and my God, we serve the same God? You, you, you folks heard that? You know, what, you, know, you folks know that that is false if you're a believer, right? So, but, you know, Josh McDowell says, but when the name of Jesus is brought in the conversation, that's where animosity or hostility actually comes in. So there is such a divide in our world every time we start talking about Jesus. All right? So I was talking with, I was talking with, our, with our music team and was telling them about the name of, the name of God, one of the you know, the names that we find there, we understand that the name, of, the name of God in the Old Covenant is the name Yahweh. Is it right? But sometimes, you know, the word Elohim is also used to pertain to God. And, you know, when we, when we were talking about songwriting and all of these things, you know, they told them that, you know, don't just put Elohim there to pertain to God because Elohim could actually mean, okay, that it actually, actually pertains to other deities as well. All right? So my point here is, my point here is, every time people start talking about God, you know, to, a certain, to a certain extent, people are fine with that. But every time you insert the name of Jesus, that's where things become different. And 
you know, truth of the matter is, it should not surprise us because Jesus himself said that this would actually happen. Okay, if you look at this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, he says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, uh, to, bring, to bring rather peace, but a sword. If you read further, he even said that, you know, for some of you, okay, there will be a what? There will be hostility between father and your know, children. Okay, on account of my name. All right, on account of his name. We understand that on account of the name of Christ, we will be mocked. We understand that on account of the name of Christ, we will be persecuted. So to a certain extent, Jesus is actually not a quote-unquote friendly name. Are you folks with me? I mean, for us here in Dumaguete, we might not feel that repercussion. Okay, for two reasons. Number one could be we live in a religious culture which accepts who Jesus is. Number two could be you haven't been speaking about Jesus you know, more the, uh, as, you, as how you ought to be speaking about him. So there could be two reasons for that. Look at this. Luke, Luke chapter 8, verse 22. He says, Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Jesus was very clear that on account of his name, we will be persecuted. All right? So. I just have to say that because, okay, as a local church, as a local church, we keep sending you out to so many places and nations out there, to different cities and nations. And I hope and pray that when God brings you to a certain nation and you will be persecuted, you will go back to this preaching and realize that indeed, okay, we did tell you that these things will happen to us. I'd like for us to, under, to understand this. On account of Christ, we will be persecuted. But on the merit of Christ, we are saved. That should bring comfort to each and every one of us. And then it says here, it says here, look at this, in verse, uh, in verse 13, in the latter part of verse 13, he, does, he doesn't just tell them, he doesn't just tell them, okay, all right, um, uh, we are in Caesarea Philippi at the backdrop of this uh, pagan Baal worship. He doesn't just say, okay, who do people say that I am? Okay, he actually say. He actually uh, tells that, or, or rather asks that to his disciples. But rather, pertaining to the people, he says, who, does pe who do people say that the Son of Man is? That the Son of Man is. I'd like for us to turn our Bibles farewell to Daniel chapter 7. Okay, turn your Bibles farewell to Daniel chapter 7. I don't have it here on the screen. But I'd like for you to see this for a while. Um, because too often, we would realize, or we would, rather we would, re we would read, that there was quite a, all right, are you folks there? There was quite a number of times that Jesus referred to himself as the, as the Son of Man. So we have to go back to where this have originated. All right, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, okay, it says here, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, look at this, to the Son of Man was given, okay, what was given to him? Dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him or worship him. This, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. All right? So, that, that's, that's, that, that's the context of the words, Son of Man. It's actually a title. Okay, so Bible is very clear in Daniel chapter 7 that to the Son of Man, okay, dominion was given by the Ancient of Days, which actually pertains to God the Father, as we understand. And Jesus uses this title for himself over and over again. This wasn't the only time. This wasn't the first time. He would keep referring to himself as the Son of Man. So we ask his disciples now, I did that to wake you up, okay? He asks his disciples now, okay, who do people say that the Son of Man is? He asks. Who do people that say that the Son of Man is? And here is the response. Look at this. In, in verse 14, here's the consensus, okay? Here's the consensus. Of course, you know, he was actually pertaining to himself, okay? So he wanted, he wanted to make his disciples understand that indeed, he is the Son of Man, all right? He is the Son of Man, 
And he was, he was asking them, what are other people's perception of about who I am? And here's their response. In verse 14, it says here, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Alright? So that's interesting. That's interesting. I mean, come to think of this. Um, you don't just you don't just reference to yourself as an Elijah. Right? You don't just go to your friends and tell you and tell your friends, you know what? I am like Moses or I'm like Abraham. You don't you don't say stuff like that. But you know, when people start telling that you have like you know, uh, the, 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 the Davidic kind of courage in your stuff like that. You take that as a compliment. Now, that was people's perception of who Jesus was. That he was one of the many prophets. In fact, you know what? If you, might, if you would allow me to use this term, he was one of those elite prophets that they had. But as much as, as, much as this sounds good, as much as this was the popular opinion, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand this. This was a misconception. Alright? As much as this was, you know, the popular opinion about him that he's like Elijah or whoever, or Jeremiah, this was a misconception. Why? Why? Why was this a mix- misconception? Because he's not just a prophet. Amen. Come on now. Come on now. Those of you will be going to Qatar, to Jordan. To, to, to Saudi Arabia, to Dubai. Okay, as you, as you, you, know, uh, you know, encounter and you know, interact with people there, I want you to understand this. Jesus isn't just a prophet. Amen. He isn't just a prophet. And we fully understand that. And you know, he, and he, he doesn't just, he doesn't interrupt he doesn't interrupt that and say, hey, you know what? Hey, I'm not just a prophet. He doesn't say that. He doesn't interrupt that. Instead, here's what happened. Look at this. In verse 15, he starts asking, okay, they said, some say, um, Jesus. Okay, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're like Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Here's how Jesus interjected. Jesus, didn't, J- Jesus wasn't like, excuse me? It wasn't like that. He interjected with what? Come on now. He interjected with another question. He interjected with another question. All right, that's their popular, that's the popular opinion. That's what they have to say about me. Those who do not have a relationship with me, that's their perception of me. In fact, you can bring that to the contemporary culture right now. And every time you start talking about Jesus, even to other world religious leaders, they will always have a good perception of who Jesus is. Okay, whether, whether that person embraces Hinduism, Buddhism, they will all tell you that Jesus was a good guy. Come on now. But I want you to understand is Jesus isn't just a nice guy. Jesus isn't just a good guy. He isn't just a prophet. So he wanted, Jesus wanted to draw the answer, not from other people. He wanted to draw the answer from what? From his disciples themselves. And I want us to understand that today, Jesus would want to draw the answer from us as a local church. And here's, Jesus, here's what he asked them. Look at this. He asked them. He said to them, everybody say them. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? While I was reading that, I was tempted to tell all of you here today, and I was really tempted to create an application question out of this and ask you, all right, MC, so who is Jesus to you? What is Jesus, I mean, what is your perception of Jesus? But I realized, wait a second. Before I asked that question, before I asked that, que- that question, I realized that the word them here is actually important. The word them here is actually important. And here's what I'd like for us to understand. And everybody say order. Everybody say order. Okay, there is an order to this that we need to understand. All right? And I want you to read yourself with this. But there's an order to this that I'd like for us to understand. Every time we talk about our opinion, our perception, our understanding, our acknowledgement of who Jesus is, I want you to understand this. It has to first be communal 
before it is personal. Alright? It has to be communal first before it is personal. If I ask EJ right now, okay, if I ask, uh, I, I was supposed to ask the leaders yesterday in, in one of our group chats, I was supposed to ask them who Jesus is to them. And you know what I'm going to get from people? Okay, I could actually answer for all of you. If I ask you, who is Jesus to you? Here's how you're going to answer me. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Isn't it? I mean, for, for you who have been a Christian for the longest time, that has always been an answer. That has always been an, our answer. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Is there something wrong with that? Of course not. Is that not true? Of course that is true. But the funny thing here is, I'd like for us to understand this, he asked them corporately. I want us to understand this. Yes, Jesus is your Lord and Savior, but I'd like for us to understand that Jesus is also what? The Lord of all creation. Think about this for a while. I mean, think about this for a while. If Jesus is not just your Lord and Savior, you know, sometimes that sounds like, you know, Jesus becomes our puppet. Sometimes just, it, it sounds like Jesus is becoming like what? Our, our teddy bear, our puppy, or stuff like that. But if I tell you right now, if I tell you right now, yes, Jesus is your Lord and Savior, but He is also Lord of all creation, it changes our perspective. It changes our, our perspective. In what sense? Here, here, here's what I'd like for us to understand. Whether people confess, you here today, whether people confess that Jesus is Lord or not, He remains to be Lord. Come on now. Jesus is not Lord based on your opinion. Right? Whether people confess with their mouth, that Jesus is Lord or not, He remains to be Lord. The Lordship of Christ, I want you to understand this, the Lordship of Christ does not diminish over the unbelief of the people out there. He remains to be Lord, remains subject under His Lordship. We are still asked to submit under the Lordship of Christ. It's interesting because while I was looking into this, I realized that, um, you know, I, I, was, I just remembered a story in the creation account. You remember, you remember on the seventh day, um, it says there on the seventh day of the creation, it says there that God actually rested. You folks remember that? On the seventh day, he rested. And, and you know, um, the manner in which we understand that is, okay, God rested so that, God rested so that when man opens his eyes, the very first thing he would look at, he would look at is G God looking at him and enjoying his presence. Sounds good. It's so anthropocentric, so centered on ourselves. Come on now. But the literal translation of that is, if you look at that, it gives us a picture that when God rested, it gives us a picture actually that God, what? has the earth as his footstool. I think about that. You folks saw that recent photos of the universe? I mean, th those sharp photos of the universe? I'm not sure, but th did that give you some goosebumps? No? <laughs> I think about that, and I realize, I think about the, the, the creation account, it tells me that every time I think about the Lordship of Christ, every time I think about the Lordship of Christ, Filipino culture, every time we think about the Lordship of Christ, do not think of pendants or bracelets or necklaces. Think of the cosmos. Friends, listen. Victory Dumaguete. We serve and worship a cosmic king. That is who Jesus is. That is why I was telling you a while ago, do not come before the presence of God during worship through the preaching of the word, and there you are sleeping. We cannot afford to do that. We don't have the warrant to be able to do something like that in front of the cosmic king. Sometimes our perspective should change, and our perspective will only change 
if we understand God's word, be, you know, people would say that you know what, um, the higher our doxology, the higher, the, rather, the higher our theology, the higher our doxology. You worship God based on your understanding of who God is. So now I, ta- I ask us the same question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? Some of you students, you go back in the classrooms. Come August, your, your, your classmates will have a perception of who Jesus is. I was having a conversation with one of our students here, with some of our students rather, and we were talking about some of our professors in some of our universities here. And we have professors of ethics, professors of different subjects, of religious subjects, that talks about things that are not scriptural, that, ba- that are not bound in the scripture. Now I want you to understand this. The world will have a perception or an opinion of who Jesus is. It's time for you to have your very own other than understanding that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Friends, if you've been a Christian, Christian for quite some time now, I think it's time for you to have, I think, by now, you have already graduated from your Papa God theology. From accepting Jesus in your heart theology. You should have graduated from that already. Going back to this, I did say that it is communal first before it is personal. I was talking with, I think that was Brian uh, a few days ago. We were talking, and, you know, we were having a discussion about quiet time and stuff like that. And yeah, you know, quiet time is great, isn't it? Like a lot of you, all of you, rather, you do your quiet times. Your, your solitude, it's actually good. But like what I said, Bible tells us that faith comes from, come on now, from reading, from hearing. When the word is preached, when we come together with the rest of the believers, that's where we grow. I'm not undermining quiet times. I, I do that every single day. It's totally fine. It, it makes me grow in my walk with Christ. But at the end of the day, it's communal first before it is personal. I think about this, and I take a closer look on the, on the question of Jesus. He was like, okay, how about you? Um, what is your perception of me? That was his question to his, uh, that was his questions, uh, question rather to his disciples. Um, who do you say that I am? So again, I said it's corporate. I think about it and realize, okay, this is how important a statement of faith in the church is. When God brings you to Malta, when God brings you to London, when God brings you to Paris, when God brings you to Chicago, when God brings you to New York, God brings you to Toronto and Vancouver, whether in Somalia, Ethiopia, Cape Town, wherever God brings you, Bahamas, we just sent off Che, and you're going to choose for yourself a church Go to the website, go to the statement of faith, and see what they have to say about our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the statement of faith. Look at the creeds and confession that they embrace. There are ancient boundaries that contemporary culture should not be moving. And this is very important in our generation right now. I want you to understand that this is a storm waiting to happen in the Philippines. Well, actually, it's already happening. That liberal theology is creeping in. Liberation theology in in North America is so big. Progressive Christianity is already in, even among evangelical circles. And sometimes, Christians as we are, we cannot distinguish what one from the other. Why? Because you actually do not know who Jesus actually is.
Who is Jesus to us? Jesus wanted them to make a public confession out of what? The general perception that was rampant during their time. You know, when I talk about, when I, when I say stuff like, you need to know what Jesus is, listen, I'm not just talking about the, the cerebral aspect of our understanding of who Jesus is. I'm, I, I am, as much as, as much as I enjoy, uh, as much as I enjoy talking with many of you, I enjoy talking to, 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 to Jairo, to, 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 to Matt about, the, about philosophy and stuff like that. And it's actually a good thing. It helps us as Christians. But the cognitive understanding that we have should be an experiential one. Remember those two guys walking in a maze? Jesus opens scriptures to them and tells them about everything that points to him. What did they say afterwards? Were not our hearts burning while we were with him? So it's not just cerebral, it has to be experiential. So if I ask you right now, from corporate, from communal to personal, who is Jesus to you? I know for a fact that we have a variety of answers here. Amen. I know for a fact that you have Jesus who healed you of diabetes, who healed you of cancer. I knew for a fact that Jesus was the one who, has comf- who comforted you. I knew for a fact that Jesus was the one you understand provided for you, caused miracles to happen in your life. And these are good things, but I'd like for us to understand, it always has to be communal and personal. Those two things are important. Friends, listen, there is no such thing as a non-church Christianity. On the laziest of Sundays that you have, drug yourself to church. Drug yourself to corporate worship. Because you would realize how much you need it. You know, the question that he was asking his disciples, um, who do you say that I am, could actually be changed in certain ways. It could be actually mentioned this way. Jesus was actually asking asking them, um, why are you following me? You know what? I did that for myself yesterday while I was working on this. I started writing that, why am I following Jesus in the first place? Am I following Jesus because I'm a pastor? What if I am not a pastor? Will I be following Jesus? So what are the grounds? What are the grounds? Why are you here in the first place? Why are you following Jesus in the first place? There has to be a certain reason to that. And I hope and pray, listen for a while. I hope and pray that you will be able to articulate that very reason that you have. That you will have a reason for your belief. A reason as to why you are following Christ. You know what I love about this? You remember last Sunday, if you were here last Sunday, we actually talked about corporate identity, isn't it? Right? That I did say we have different corporate identities. Uh, we said that you know what, uh, some of our corporate identities could be we, are, we could belong to a uh, uh, you know, uh, a fitness group. Okay, kami, yan. Kami ni na, pas, ni na, ni na kin. Okay, so yan, mga ganyan. So, bike club, right? That could be your corporate identity. Uh, but, super, you know, the superior identity that we have is our identity as God's people. Do you folks realize that this is also a question of identity? But now, it's not our identity, it's the identity of Jesus. He asked him, who do people say the Son of Man is? Who do you say that I am? He was actually drawing from them their understanding of his identity. You know why? Because discipleship in a Christian context will always stem for our, from our understanding of, our identi- of the identity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to us corporately as a church? Who is Jesus to you personally as a Christian? Please answer that question. If I may say this, when you go home later, right after the service, when you have lunch, can you pull out those two questions and ask that to each other? 
whoever it is that you're going to have lunch with, can we please do that for a while later? Not, not now, but please do that later. Okay, ask those two questions. Who is Jesus to us? Corporately as a local church. And who is Jesus to you personally? And I know for a fact that you will arrive at certain answers to that. Now look at this. In response, in verse 16, here's the confession. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ. You are no Jeremiah. You are no Elijah. You're no Moses. You're not even Abraham. Listen, friends, Peter was like, You're greater than those people. He says, You are Christos. You are Christ Himself, the Son of the Living God. And I want you to understand, I want you, I want you to imagine this for a while. I want us to imagine the eyes of Peter here. If you would allow me to use your imagine, allow us to use our imagination for a while. At the backdrop of this pagan worship, I, wa- I want us to imagine the eyes of Peter. That Peter was looking at all of this Baal worship around them. And he looks at Jesus and say, you are the Christ. Not just a prophet, not just any deity, you are the Christ. Then he says, the son of the living God. He emphasizes you know, living God here because like what I said, around them were a group of dead gods. Gods made with hands. Gods who can perform what God, what the living God can perform. Dead gods for that matter. Friends, listen. We serve and worship the one true living God. Amen. We serve and worship the one true living God. Here's what Jesus has to say about him. This is interesting. Jesus answered to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. All right? Jesus was like, oh man, you got it right. I'd like for us to understand the different exchanges of Peter and Jesus in the Bible. It's either what, it, it's either what a rebuke or get you behind me, Satan. But now, he tells Simon his full name. It's like, I don't know with you, but I, I, did your mother, your, your mom, has he ever done something like this? When they get so pissed off with you, they call your complete name? Thomas Morris Villegas, descendant of Leon Kilat. Asa ang pagkaon. People would do that, right? To emphasize something. To emphasize the, the, the gravity of the situation. And Jesus calls him, Simon, son of Jonah. You got it right. You got it right. Right in front of you is the Son of Man. Right in front of you is Christ himself, the Messiah, the long-awaited one, the anointed one. I am the anointed one. Friends, listen, I don't know with you, but I look into this and it just tells me about the revelatory power that is right in front of me here in this very verse. Human as he was, he got it right. But actually, here's what Jesus told him. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You know what it means? Why are you here today? Why are you here today? Why do you cry sometimes over the preaching of the gospel? Why is there such an experiential experience and a cognitive experience every time we start talking about Jesus? Why are you here? That's the question. I want you to understand this. You're here. You're here because of God's initiative in your life. 
Because God chose you. Like what I said last Sunday, not because we are a choice people. No, God simply chose you. I got I, I, be, I, I got born again when I was 19 years old. Prior to that, I had, I, I had my religion classes. And every time I open the Bible, I have this Bible given to me. Every time I open the Bible, man, I just find myself laughing because it's so funny. It's so funny. I can't comprehend what, what kind of a book is this. But for some reason, the moment I became a Christian, every time I open God's Word, for some reason I do for a fact understand that God speaks to me directly. That the Holy Spirit speaks to me. That I started understanding. My mind, my mind started comprehending it. That I can't get enough of it. That I wanted to study God's Word over and over and over again. Why? Because God revealed Himself to me. God revealed Himself to you. And I realize if that is the case, or rather if that was not the case, I could be just one of those persons biking out there. I used to bike, by the way. When I was in college, believe it or not, I was as thin as Tim. I would be what? I would, I'd be a, a, a lost environmentalist out there. I, I rallied there in Perdices, Perdices without, without slippers or shoes. I can just imagine how crazy life would be like. And I started thinking about my mom. Started thinking about my dad. My dad was a Chinese Muslim. My mom and, uh, was, was, a, was a member of the Iglesia Ni Christa Church. We, we attended Jesuit Catholic school. All of us brothers and sisters. And I can't help it. I wanted, and I was telling, I was telling Rian, man, I, I want to preach the gospel to them. And guess what? Friends, listen. One by one, one by one, one by one, my family started getting saved. By whose initiative? By God's initiative. So friends, listen. You're here because God chose you. You're here because God took the initiative. So, friends, listen. Don't take this for granted. I hope you don't become what? A 10-year-old, 15-year-old Christian. Okay, I know that already. I've been there already. Friends, listen. There's so much to learn for a person who exhibits humility. How about the lost zeal and the lost fire that you once had for God, for the kingdom of God? Where is that now? You know how to rekindle that? How, how to rekindle the fire that you used to have before? Ask this question. Who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus to us? Who do people say that I am? Who do you say I am? Look at verse 18, and I want to end with this. And I tell you, he says, You are Petros, and on this Petra I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is where there's a great divide between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant understanding of this verse. And the people wrongly assume that when Jesus told Peter that on this rock I will build my church and the gates and the gates rather of hell shall not prevail against it. People thought that at that junction Peter would become the first pope and would therefore you know from him will run an, an apostolic succession up until our day right now. And only the only the the, you know, the, the papal voice, the bishops, the cardinals will have authority over what happens in the church and over the word of God for the church. 
And we just understand that that is not actually the case. If we, if we understand this, if we understand this specific verses right here. That's why in First Peter, if you remember, there is such a thing as a common priesthood. That every single member of the church embraces his or her priesthood. That every single one of us has been, what, designated by God to bring about the ministry of reconciliation. So that's not how you understand that. Jesus was simply telling him, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. Petra, there is like a, a, a bedrock for that matter. In essence, Jesus was simply saying that the church will be built on me. The church will be built on me, the cornerstone. Everything will emanate from me, not from Peter. I mean, props to Peter, of course. The same way that we give props to, to Mary, that God used them mightily. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's actually taken from Isaiah chapter 20 verse 22. I don't have it here. But it says here, I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. In essence, here's what he talks about. Jesus was actually telling Peter, Peter, I am actually appointing you as a steward of my kingdom. As a steward of my kingdom, it will be your job to watch and care for my kingdom. You folks remember this? You remember this in John chapter 21? Take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. And guys, guess what? Instead of like a, uh, instead of like a position that Jesus gave them, you know what God gave them actually? God gave them a mission. God gave us a mission. And Jesus was like, okay, from now on, it's going to be the church. The church will be what? The church will be my representative. The church will bring the goodness about me to all corners of the world. If you don't preach, people won't hear the gospel. So we have a mission. Would you tell your seatmate for a while? We have a mission. And here's what I'd like for us to understand. Your mission is God's mission. Because in reality, we don't have a personal mission. We simply join God's mission, and His mission is our mission. Not the clergy, not the pastors, not the staff, but every single one of us. We will give an account to God for how we have fulfilled the mission that He has given us. Go out there, preach the gospel, and make disciples of all nations. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace in our life. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, because we can look to you, our cornerstone, for strength, for wisdom, for everything good that emanates from you. While all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, I want to pray for some of you here. You know, I felt I want to pray for some of you. If you're here today, if you're here today, and I don't know, um, maybe some of you are tired, some of you are exhausted, some of you are, you're just emotional perhaps. You're becoming emotional over something you don't understand. Some of you are confused. You folks realize that that, this, that is actually not connected to my preaching, but I strongly feel it that here this very morning. While all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, I'm going to pray for some of you. If you're that person, would you please raise your hand for a while? I'm going to pray for you. I see that hand. Just lift your hands before God. Just leave it before God. Just leave it before God in this place. I see those hands. It's okay. Just leave it before God. 
Now, this is Jesus to you right now. This is who Jesus is to you. Lord, I thank you for today. You see these hands, Lord, lifted before you. Lord, may we understand that you are the God who deeply cares for us. Lord, you deeply care for your people. Lord, there is such a high level of anxiety among some of us here today. Some of us here, Lord, cannot even comprehend and understand ourselves. Some of us here today, Lord, are in a situation, Lord, that's just rubbing the joy away from us. So Lord, we lift our hands before you because we acknowledge that these things are what we go through. And we also lift our hands before you here today. Lord, because we are asking for help. Lord, help us. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us today, Lord. Lord, as we persevere, we pray, Lord, that we will not take shortcuts. That we will also understand, Lord, that you are teaching something to us here today. Who is Jesus to us, Lord? You are indeed our Lord and our Savior. You are our helper. You are our friend. So, Lord, we draw ourselves closer to you because you've allowed us to. So, Lord, we come before you here today, Lord. And that is the cry, Lord. Hear the cries of our heart. Help us, Lord. Help us. Deliver us, God. I ask, Lord, for your grace. I ask, Lord, for even, Lord, your, your tangible nearness. Your tangible nearness in us, God. Lord, we will not give up because we understand also, well, God, that greater is He who is in us than He who is in the world. Allow us, Lord, to take captive every thought that we have in our minds right now and make it obedient to You. You said in your word, Lord, we understand, Lord, that you are, your, your, your ears are so quick to incline to the cries of the widows and the brokenhearted. You incline your ears, Lord. You listen to our cries. So, Lord, I know for a fact, Lord, that you are inclining your ears to many of us today. And you're reminding us, God, that you are with us. The Lord is reminding you right now that He is with you. When you look around you and you feel like no one's there for you, the Lord is with you. The all-powerful one the all-knowing one. And let me use this. The deeply caring one is with you. I pray, Lord, that we will have the heart of David. That we will always run to you no matter what. We will run to you in times of joy. We will run to you in times of success. We will run to you in times of pain. We will run to you, Lord, in times of trouble. We will run to you, Lord, in times 
that we sin even. Lord, you see these hands before you here today. I pray, I pray, Lord. That they will find help in you. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.